reading is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'll be reading from New King James Version. Remember, now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the days when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the street, and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up, at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden, and desire fails. For man goes to the eternal home, and the mourners go about the street. Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed. Or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. And what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails, given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by this, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We began our Bible seminar series last week by looking at what we uh, called global eschatology, or the eschatology which simply means the end times or end time things of this world. So we looked at kind of uh, a summary of the world history last week and especially focused on the future prophecies about what's going to happen in the future and how the world, basically according to the Bible, will come to an end. And today we come to the second topic, personal eschatology, and that is eschatology or the end time things concerning our individual lives. We begin by reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. As we read this chapter, if you are not familiar with this chapter, you might think that this rather sounds a little bit like a kind of poetic expression um, about life, and that is correct. Indeed, it begins by saying, we are to remember the Creator who created us, basically before your death or difficult days come. It ends by saying that this is the conclusion, and that is to keep His commandments and to know Him, because God will bring every work into judgment, whether good or evil. So before the end of your life comes, know that it is coming, and you need to know the Lord God, the Creator who made us. So this is about personal eschatology, about how our life will come to an end and that we are to do this beforehand. As we think about life and death, the end of our life, eschatology concerning our personal lives, we know that living life is important. People say that you know, life is about living and they talk about different things that we can do and enjoy in this world. But according to the Bible, 
We also see that the life is not going to last forever, uh, and we know that for, uh, for truth. Uh, we don't live indefinitely. We all come to the end of our lives. As much as it is important to know how to live good life, it is also important to know how our life comes to an end. And I can say that you can only live life well when you are prepared for your death. And I'm not talking about some practical preparations to your death, like life insurance and arranging for your own funerals and things like that. I am talking more about spiritual things that we need to be prepared to meet our Maker, the Lord God, who will eventually bring us to Him. And they say that you know, there are two certainties in this world, death and, and tax. You know, they say that you, you've got to pay tax, and death comes to everyone, but it is not, you know, we're not concerned about um, the personal affairs or the worldly affairs concerning death and how we are to prepare for the death. And I'm not going to talk about uh, writing wills and preparing for your own funerals and things like that. Nevertheless, um, that might, you know, give you some thoughts. I remember watching a documentary a while ago, and in this documentary, they did some interesting experiment with people. They brought a few people, um, largely you know, people who had never thought about death, and they went through the experience of going through death themselves. It's not that they're dying or anything like that, but they said, um, well, let's pretend that you're dying very soon. So they said, um, write your will and arrange your personal estate. So whatever they had, their possessions, they had to decide what to do with them. Um, and the exercise continued, and they even went to the point of, um, of actually going, in, those people going into the coffins themselves. So they actually made these um, mock coffins, and they said, this is the time for your death, and then they actually gave, um, went into these, these coffins, and they covered the lid. And, and that's, the, that's where the experiment ended. But it was a very highly emotional experiment for those, cons those who were actually concerned and involved in that experiment, because they had really never experienced anything like that themselves. But when they had to write their own wills, and when they actually had to go into the coffins themselves, they, a lot of them were crying, and they were weeping, and many of them said in their wills things like, uh, I'm sorry for what I've done or what I haven't done. Um, they were saying things in their hearts to the people who they really cared about. And after return, returning from the experiment, after they came back from the experiment, they all shared how emotional it was and how a lot of things that they haven't really thought about came to their mind. And, and they were not the same anymore. They were going to live their life in a very different way because they know that death can come at any time. And when it comes, then they have to leave everything behind and simply depart from this world. So while you have the opportunity, they said that I'd like to live my life in the most meaningful way to myself. Now, if preparing for your own death, like funeral and, and funerals and writing wills and estates and things like that, can have the kind of impact to the people, and just imagine then what it can do to people if they are really prepared for not just arranging what, what's left behind after their death, but they're con concerning their own death. I'm really talking about what happens to, to us when we die, not to the people who are left behind, but what happens to us when you die, when you actually die and go across that, that point of death, what's going to happen to you? Does the Bible have any answers to that question? Well, the Bible has ample truths about that. And when we think about that, there is a certain level of solemnity and some seriousness here. It may not be pleasant, it is a rather somber experience to talk about death. In fact, even the Bible portrays death as unnatural. God did not create man originally to die. In fact, God created man to enjoy life and eternity. Not that the life would be cut short by death. But something happened. And because of that, death came and we all die. So what is death? And why is there death? And those are the questions that we'd like to have a look at today. I showed you um, this slide last week, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, revision. The Bible has 
truth, um, truth about history, history of mankind as God ordained. You know, God determined the history of mankind. We saw that last week. He had predetermined, um, pre-appointed time, determined pre-appointed times for men, and also he set boundaries to our dwellings. We can also say that the Bible has God's plan towards man, and that is for every individual. And if you can, um, the cameraman, you can maybe um, point the camera to the screen when we have some um, slides on the screen. Okay, thank you. So the Bible contains history of mankind as God ordained and God's plan towards men. We can say that the first is truth about the world. That's the global truth. And second is the truth about the individual. That's the personal truth, the person, or the, the truth that applies to every person. And today we, we are going to have a look at the second part. We looked at the first part yesterday as we looked at global eschatology, but we are concerned about the individual or personal eschatology this week, today. And going back to the question, what is then death? What is death? What does the Bible tell us about death? There are a few different kinds of deaths uh, in, the, in the Bible. And the first is, there is the physical death. And that's quite simple and easy. This is what we might call cessation of bodily life. You live your life and you die. We all know what that is. The Bible says very clearly, this is um, what's going to happen to all people in the verse that we have read, um, one of the verses, verse 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. It says, the dust will return to the dust or earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. The body that was made from the dust stops its function and returns to the dust. And our spirit goes back to God. You can say that this physical death is what separates our soul or spirit from our bodies. When the body stops functioning, the soul leaves the body and returns to God who originally gave the soul. So that is physical death. And even James says, he says, life without the soul is dead. Now he's saying that when he, as he compares um, faith and, and works, you know, faith without works is dead faith. It is like a body without soul is a dead person. So if you have a body of the person, but the bodily function stopped, and then the soul has left the body, then you have a corpse, a dead body. That's physical death. The Bible also talks about spiritual death. And sometimes it doesn't say spiritual death, but simply say, it says things like we are dead, uh, that death came to this world. Uh, for example, um, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead as far as God was concerned. In Psalm 51, verse 5, David prays that, um, that, that the separation of the soul is dead, a physical death, but also he, he doesn't want to be separated from God. He says, please do not alienate myself from you, Lord. So there's a spiritual death. So when you see the word death, it helps to understand what death it is in the Bible. Now, there's also, there's also the, the third kind of death, and that is eternal death. This is death where the person is punished and banished from God for eternity. Now, this is what we might call the second death. The Bible says that it is second death, or death in the lake of fire, um, death as, uh, as punishment in eternal hell. And there are ample verses about this, and we saw one such verse last week from Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, where everybody comes to God and they are judged and all these unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. It's second death because the, the physical death is like the first death and eternal death is the second death. And you can see that the physical death applies to all people, whether Christians or non-Christians, whether believers or non-believers, Physical death applies to all people. There is no one who can escape from the death. Everybody dies. Now, spiritual death also applies to all people. Everybody, according to the Bible, is born dead spiritually. But of course, those who become believers, those who are Christians, those who become Christians, are spared or rescued from that death. They are moved from death to life. They are delivered from their spiritual death to life with God. 
So you can say that spiritual death applies to all people, but Christians are delivered from that. Now the third eternal death, you can see that it applies to only non-believers, non-Christians or people who reject God, people who are not saved, people who are not going to heaven, but into eternal hell. So there are three kinds of deaths, and this is helpful to understand what that particular passage is talking about when it talks about death. And then the second question is, why is there death? Why is there death? Now, there are about five reasons why there are deaths. The first is, death is caused by sin, or sin is the cause of death. If you look at the story of Genesis, for example, it talks about that. Um, Adam and Eve were created by God, uh, not originally to die, but to live forever. But when they sinned, they became flesh or mortal temporal beings, and death came to the world. We'll have a look at that in a minute um, in more detail as we go through Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. But sin is the cause of death. So the reason why there is death is because of sin. In other words, the reason why people die is because of sin. And that means if you're dying, if you know you're dying, that means you're affected by sin in some way. Because if you were not affected by sin, if you're not a sinner, then there's no reason to die. Death is, in this sense, a theological issue. It's not just a physiological issue. Uh, you might say, well, we get old and we get sick and we get frail and we die eventually because we lose physical strength. Now, that's how you die. That's the process of dying. The actual cause or the reason for death is sin. Sin brought death to this world and everybody is affected or you can say infected by the virus of sin and death. Sin is the cause of death. That's why there is death. And also, another point about death is, death is, is real. It is not illusion. Some people say that death is like illusion. Um, once we die, everything comes to an end and we simply disappear. That's not the case. Death is real. And that means it is not only real that the process of death, physical death, that the fact that you might get sick, the fact that you might have to go to hospital, the fact that you might be operated upon, they might try to resuscitate you but it doesn't happen, the fact that you actually die, that's real. But when I say death is real here, it's more about our own existence. Death is not the end of our existence. Death is real, and what happens after that is also real. It's not illusion. Third point is death is unnatural. It wasn't originally intended by God. God created men not to die, but to live with God eternally. In that sense, salvation or coming back to God is to restore what was lost because of sin so that we can enjoy eternal life with God. Fourth is also a very important point. Now, death is also a summon. It's like a summon to appear before God. Have you ever received a summon notice by the court? You might receive a summon notice or even summon to be in the court as a jury, and that's a legal notice. You have to be there. If you're not there, then there's a problem. Especially if you are tried in a court, you have to be there. To not appear before the court, even though you are required by law to appear before the court, is, is to commit a crime. So when you're summoned, you must be there before the judge, whether you like it or not. And you are judged by the court. Now, God is the perfect, holy, and the good judge. Nonetheless, he upholds his law, he upholds his justice, and he executes his judgment in the most just way, and everybody has to stand before God. And death is a summon to appear before God. Now, there's a story of a rich man in Luke chapter 12 in the Bible, and he was very rich and he was you know, not expecting to die anytime soon. He thought that he was going to live for a long, long time because he had a lot of money in comfort. But God told him that your soul is required of you tonight. In other words, God summoned him to stand before the, just, just, um, the justice of God, before the, the court of God on that day, before 
you know, the day was over. And then he said to the rich man, then whose will these be the things you provided for yourself? And he couldn't take his money with him. He couldn't take anything beyond the death with him. He had to leave all these things behind and simply be, stand before God. And that applies to everybody. Which means you will receive someday a summon to be before the court of God. That is your own death. So it's coming to everybody. Everybody. And then, one more point. Death is also a transition. It is not the end. It is not an annihilation. It is a transition. We move from this world into the next world. We move from being a physical being into a spiritual being. And then we stand before God. Some people teach that when we die, we simply disappear. That is not the case. Some religions teach that when we die, we are born to some other beings, reincarnation. The Bible doesn't teach that. That is not the truth according to the Bible. The Bible says that every person is unique and distinctly different from all the other creatures. And you, know, you don't become an animal and then become a man and become a creature, become, become a worm or even a plant. You're a person, a human being, born into this world as a unique being. And when you die, you exist and you continue to exist as who you are. You don't cycle through some different lives in this world. The Bible teaches that we all stand before God after living one life in this world. In fact, if you look at these things, some things um, may give you a little sort of um, bit of depressing thoughts, a little bit of a uh, you know, frightening thought to stand before the court of God, that it is real, that we don't simply disappear, but it is only a transition. But at the same time, there's a positive side about this as well. This gives both hope and despair, I suppose, depending on where you stand. It is hope for those who know that they will be with God in eternity in his glory. But this gives despair and fear to those people who are unsure about what's going to happen beyond death. You can even um, say that this is either going to end in a positive way or a negative way, or comedy or tragedy, which is a title for next week. And that's going to uh, be next week's topic. So. Rather than talking about then how then can we go to heaven, which is next week's um, message, I'm going to talk to you about the actual eschatology of our lives, that is personal death and how it'll happen and what's going to happen and why it happens. Now the Bible talks about two different kinds of resurrections as well, and, and that's, uh, let's not jump to that too soon, but let's actually move to Genesis. Put a bookmark in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. But let's have a look at a few verses in Genesis and see how death came to this world. Now Genesis chapter 1 talks about creation. Don't have time to go through Genesis 1, but um, I've covered this creation in some other, another Bible seminar series where we talked about creation and our salvation. But in Genesis chapter 2, we have a beginning of um, a kind of sin. In fact, God gives Adam this command in verse 17, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. There is the mention of death or die here for the first time. So do not break my command. If you do, then you will die. He said you will surely die. And then in chapter 3, Satan comes to Adam and Eve, and eventually he tempts Eve to eat that fruit that God told them not to eat. And when she ate, she gave it to her husband, and he also ate. That story is in chapter 3, but let's pick up from verse 3, and um, I'll read verse 3. This is what the devil is saying. But of the fruit of the tree, this is what the woman said, but of the tree, the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, God had said, you shall not eat it, nor you shall touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, 
your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes and tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked. They sewed thick leaves together and made themselves covering. They tried to cover themselves but, of course, um, fig leaves couldn't be proper covering or clothes. So when they, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So this is how they began, uh, well, how the sin began in their lives. And then Adam says, the woman gave me the fruit, so I ate. And then woman says, the serpent gave me, uh, well, serpent deceived me, and I ate the fruit. So they actually became um, sinful. But not only that, because of what God has said before, they became basically a mortal being that they were going to die. So death came to them. Look at verse 19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So their bodies would return to the dust. Physical death. But not only that, when they sinned, they were cut off from God spiritually as well. So you can say that, just going back to um, the previous slide, that physical death came to them because of their sin, but also spiritual death came to them as well. And if God left them at that condition, in that condition, then they would have gone to eternal death as well. Had God not saved them, then they have all these three deaths happening to them. But of course, God was gracious and merciful that Adam and Eve were saved by God's grace. And they might have the first death, physically dead. They were spiritually dead, but when they were saved, they were delivered out of that. So they would not face the eternal death, the third kind of death. So, that's how sin came to the world. And Paul, in Romans, summarizes it pretty well. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. Just flip back to the New Testament. Move over to the New Testament from the Old Testament. And let's look at chapter 5 in Romans. In verse 12, in Romans verse 12, 5, 12, verse, chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man, that is Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Now this is one summary, one verse summary of what we have read in Genesis chapter 3. Because of one man, sin entered the world, and death came through sin, and thus death spread to all men, all people who were born from Adam and Eve, were infected by sin, and that's why we all sin. Now, as I told you before, um, just going back again to this slide, we have the physical death and spiritual death and eternal death. And to understand our personal eschatology, uh, let me introduce the concept of resurrection as well. Now, for Christians, for those of you who are Christians, you know, we are going to die physically provided the Lord doesn't return before, um, before we die. We looked at that last week, the rapture and all that. But, you know, if we die, we die physically. But because we are saved, we don't have spiritual death. So then what happens to us? We die physically, but not spiritually. So what does that mean? The Bible says there is a kind of intermediate, in, intermediate sta um, state where we as Christians die physically, but we are with God in God's presence spiritually. 
So we still continue to exist, but we are only spiritual, not physical. Our physical bodies are buried in the ground if you are buried in, in the ground. But after some time, we who are alive spiritually with God will be brought together with our physical bodies that have been buried, and by the miraculous power of God, the dead bodies will be brought back to life and our spirits will be reunited with the dead bodies and we will be resurrected. Now this is a very fascinating concept, those of you who uh, may not be familiar with this, but basically this is what we celebrate on, on the Easter. On the Easter we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and also celebrate the fact that we as believers will be resurrected with Christ in the future. So we will be resurrected when that resurrection happens. The Bible also talks about there is also another kind of resurrection. There are two kinds of resurrections. One is the resurrection of believers that I have just told you about. But there is also the resurrection of unbelievers, resurrection of those people who are not Christians. The Bible says, in fact, Jesus says in John chapter um, 5, let's turn to John chapter 5, that this is the resurrection to condemnation. Turn to John 5. Verse 27, 28. Let me read from verse 20, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear, the, hear his voice and come forth those who have done good, because they're Christians, um, not morally but spiritually, to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, because they do not believe in God, they reject Christ spiritually, not just about moral evil. It says to the resurrection of condemnation. So there are two kinds of resurrections. Resurrection of life, to live eternally, and the resurrection of condemnation, that is to face that eternal the third kind of death. So there are two kinds of resurrections. So when you look at death, we have death and resurrection. Resurrection of life and resurrection of, of death. So just keep those things in, in your mind and um, we'll have a look at this slide that we saw last week. This will give you a little bit of revision of what we studied last week and also um, continue on with the personal eschatology. Now, we saw that we are living in a period called the church period, or the church on earth um, period. You might say this is the era of, of church, or some people say that this is the era of grace, era as E-R-A, era of grace, because this is when God pours his grace upon um, not only Jews, but the Gentiles as well. So the church is formed as a result of that. And after this time, Sometime in the future, rapture will take place and church will be taken up to heaven. We saw that uh, last week in detail. And during that time, um, we have what we call judgment seat of Christ, where Christians are standing before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the judgment to do with hell. This is simply to give an account of our life after receiving salvation as Christians. You know, how, how well or how not so well you have lived your Christian life and you'll be rewarded as such. And also, we have the marriage of the Lamb. So this is the, like the feast, the party, you can say heavenly party for Christians with Christ. And while this is going on, something else is happening in this world. That's the church in heaven. The world goes through the seven years of terrible tribulation. We saw that last week as we read through Revelation chapters 6 to 18. Remember the seven trumpets, seven seals, and seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls in that order? And every time a trumpet blows and seal is opened and then um, the bowl is poured out, um, plague happens. Terrible things happen. People are killed. Some one-third of mankind die because of some warfare. Um, and people are burned. Um, they die because of some um, disease. All kinds of terrible things happen in the, the cosmic world, in the universe, and the earth and the rivers and ocean and the water. So, so terrible destruction happens during this time, seven years of tribulation. And after this time, this will come to an end, the return of Christ happens, which means Jesus will return to the earth. And when he comes back to the earth, also Christians who had 
gone up to heaven, come back together. Now, by that time, Christians who are in heaven have been transformed or resurrected. And we'll have a look at that in a, in a minute. Um, and they come back on earth in some different form. Not in this form, but uh, in a more glorified form. Uh, we'll be uh, like Christ. Uh, we will be certainly different from our physical flesh right now. And after that, there is the millennium kingdom for a thousand years. We saw that also from Revelation last week. There's a description of that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. For a thousand years, this world becomes like uh, the paradise because the devil is locked up during that thousand years. So uh, there's no influence of the devil, Satan, demons in this world. However, at the end, there is a brief time of rebellion and judgment. We read also last week that the key, the key opens the bottomless pit for, for a moment. And then all these demons and the devil are released for a time and they come and deceive the people and tempt people in the millennium kingdom and they either have to choose to believe in God and serve God or to follow the devil and rebel against God. It, it's likely that the most of them or vast majority of them will rebel against God and they are judged by God as well. And that's um, what happens after the millennium kingdom. And after that we move into the eternal state, heaven or hell. That's what we uh, saw last week and that's where we ended. But as I told you, there is the resurrection of believers, so resurrection to life. And that happens at this point after the church period. And through this resurrection, we are taken up through the rapture and to heaven. So this is the church in heaven. And also, we talked about the 144,000 last week. And these are the Christians who are saved during the tribulation time. And these Christians, most of them die during this tribulation because of Antichrist's persecution. And because they also physically die, they go through the same intermediary um, transition. Um, they, their bodies are buried or their bodies go through decay uh, physically, but their souls are taken to heaven but they also are reunited their dead bodies and they go through another resurrection. So this is the second stage of resurrection. So you can say the first resurrection, um, resurrection of believers that happens at the end of church on earth period is the first resurrection, which is resurrection, of, resurrection to life. And second stage of resurrection, which is also resurrection to life, happens at the end of the tribulation for the tribulation saints. And all this time, those who are dead and, and unbelieving, uh, non-Christians, unbelievers who are dead, they continue. Their bodies are in the graves and their souls are in a place called Sheol or Hades, which is basically another word for hell. We can say that that's a kind of temporary hell and they are kept there until their bodies and their souls are reunited again through what we call um, the resurrection to condemnation. So another resurrection happens, and this is the resurrection of unbelievers, and that happens after the millennium kingdom. So you can see that there are two kinds of resurrections. Resurrection to life and resurrection to condemnation. And that's basically eschatology concerning every individual. Those who are dead in Christ, those who are dead with faith, as we saw last week, will be raised to be incorruptible. But those who are dead in their sins, apart from Christ, will be, will be in Hades. And eventually they'll be resurrected to condemnation. So the Bible says that we face this kind of two, um, two eschatology, or two options, you might say. And there are many verses that talk about these things we saw from Psalm 90 um, that the days of our lives are 70 years or maybe for strong 80 years so while we are alive the psalmist says in verse 12 teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom teach us so that we can know how frail and how short our life is so that we might gain a heart of wisdom we know, just as we read from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, that there is the beginning and there is also the end. In chapter 3, 
The writer of Ecclesiastes says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. And before the time comes, you are to remember your Creator. Now let's go back to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 to our main text. If you put a bookmark, come back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and let's have a look at some passages here in this chapter. Now in chapter 12 verse 1, the writer of this book, Solomon says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Now there are many young people here. He says, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because difficult days will come. And it will be so difficult that you may not have the sanity, mental capacity to understand the Bible or the things concerning God. And often I also feel that as people get older, they become more stubborn. So it's less likely that they will listen to any advice like this. When people are still soft and uh, malleable in their hearts, when the, the people are still young and, and they can still go through some formation uh, process, it is helpful to listen to the truth like this in the Bible. Before the difficult days come, remember your Creator. And think about that. Who is your Creator? Who? It's not your parents. Your Creator is the one who gave you life your physical being, but also your life as well. And that is the Lord God, who is the source of all life. All life comes from God. I mean, if you think about that, life only comes from life. Life does not come from something that is not living. Even plants have seed, and seeds germinate, and they give fruit. So you have fruit from living tree, not dead tree. Same goes with animals and even human beings. You only have babies and, and offspring from living parents. So life cannot originate from something that is not living. And that's a huge um, truth that you know, undermines basically um, science, as many people know it, you know, biology, and evolution theory, that life originally originated from some... Um, some pre, 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 uh, primordial soup, um, some amoeba, single cell, living thing. You know, where did that come from? It came from some kind of organic substance um, and say that life originated from some organic substance. Well, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, the principle in this world is that you never get anything that is living from something that is not living. Living things come from living things. And the first life had to come from someone the source of life, and that is, according to the Bible, God. The living God, the life source. So before this day comes, you are to remember your Creator who gave you life, who gave you your physical being, your spiritual life, and all that, everything that we have. Keep reading. It says in verse 2, very interesting and quite fascinating. He says, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, because they will get darkened. As you get older, things become darkened. That's how this psalm, well, this psalm poet, you can say Solomon, portrays our life. As we get older, it's like the sun, moon, stars, light get darkened. We are not as bright. And the clouds do not return after the rain, before the clouds return after the rain. The clouds come with rain, and that's a kind of purpose it serves. And then once it rains, then it goes away. But before that happens, when the cloud still has the strength to pour out that rain, when you still have the physical strength to think about your life and your eschatology and your Creator, remember your Creator. In verse 3, in the day when you, when the keepers of the house tremble, what is this referring to? Keepers of the house? Many say that this refers to our legs. As you get older and lose strength, your legs and you, your knees tremble. And often uh, you have to rely on your staff, walking stick. 
And if you get even older, you might not be able to even walk and have to rely on wheelchairs to get around because your keepers are trembling, keepers of the house. If you imagine your body to be the house, the keepers are the pillars, your legs that are trembling. And the strong men or strong men bow down because as people get older, they, they bend forward. Their back loses its um, uh, straight line and you bend either forward um, or go down, you, you bow down and you strong, you strong man, your back loses strength. He says also, when the grinders cease because they are few, what do you think this is referring to? Grinders are teeth. Teeth fall out one by one and they are few and few, you know, fewer and fewer in, in number. And grinders can't grind or chew as much as you used to. You just don't enjoy eating as much. I used to know a man, he was in his 50s, and I think he was um, losing his teeth so much that he lost almost all his teeth. And he told me one day that once he started losing teeth, the steak wasn't as tasty as before. You know, steak is not only about the taste, but it's about chewing. And he really misses uh, the, the days when he could chew the steak and feel the flavor of the juice from that juicy steak. He doesn't feel that anymore, and he lost appetite hugely because of that. So grinders cease because there are few. And those that look through the window grow dim. And that's because your eyes grow dim. You lose your eyesight. Your eyes become less um, effective. Um, you can't see the things that are far away. Well, you, you kind of you know, begin with nearsightedness, and then you become farsightedness. So things that were visible well or not so visible and you have to either bring things closer to you or further away from you to get focus and you often have to wear multifocal glasses and sometimes even just magnifying glasses to be able to read fine prints because our eyes that look through the windows grow dim. But before this happens, now remember your Creator. And verse 4, when the doors are shut in the streets, it's like you lose your, your hearing sense as well. Doors are shut. When you close the door and try to shout to the person inside the room, you have to shout and it kind of muffles. The sound is not as clear. And the sound of grinding is low, grinding teeth again. And, one, when, and it says, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, when, when just one little bird chirps, you wake up because you don't get to sleep so deeply. Little kids can sleep through terrible chaos, you know, things may, may, may uh, get destroyed and then they still slip through the whole thing. Um, but as you get older, you become more sensitive to those things. So you awake, even at the sound of a little bird. And the daughters of music are brought low, which refers to our voice, the you know, vocal cord. You might have a beautiful singing voice, speaking voice, but as you get older, your voice loses that beauty. And the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height. You become afraid of height. You become afraid of other things that you were not so afraid of before. You don't enjoy those uh, roller coasters and all these rides in fun amusement parks as before. You, know, you used to enjoy that when you're younger. As you get older, it's not so much joy, but it's, it's a fright. And the terrors in the way. And the almond tree blossoms. You know, there's, there's a terror, you know, you're fri frightened of um, anything that's on the way. And the almond tree blossoms, which also refers to the gray hair. You start to have more gray hair. Your hair becomes white. It's like a tree that gives that white flower. Green turns to white. The grasshopper is a burden. Even something that is as light as grasshopper is heavy. And desire fails. You lose appetite. You lose desire to do anything. Desire to succeed and put in any effort. You just lose energy. As you get older, that happens. For man goes to his eternal home. And the mourners go about the streets. You can see clearly the writer is talking and describing our death or aging process. Eventually coming to death in this passage. Man goes to his eternal home. The mourners go about the streets. 
in a sense, this is a euphemism because this is eternal home. But for those who are unbelievers, it's not so homey home, is it? Resurrection to condemnation, eternal hell, to be separated from God forever, that doesn't sound like inviting. When you go home, you want to be invited. You want to feel inviting. You want to feel comfortable. For believers, that is the case. For Christians, when you go home to heaven, you come home to eternal home. But for those who are not believers, that is not the case. But nonetheless, everybody goes through this aging process. Well, if, you, uh, if your life is cut short before this happens, then you still, you know, you go to God. But many people mostly go through this aging process and they die. And the mourners will go about the streets. In verse 6, he repeats it again. So remember you created before the silver cord is loosed. Before the great days of your life. The days of your youth and your strong days before they are gone. Or the golden bowl is broken. Or the pitcher shattered in the fount at the fountain. Or the wheel broken at the well. Now this wheel is the wheel that's um, at the top of the well to draw water. So if you imagine you have a well, you go there with a pitcher to draw water, the wheel is broken so it's not functioning, you can't draw water anymore, the pitcher is even shattered so that you cannot hold the water. Our bodies just break down with aging and disease. We cannot contain our life in ourselves and our life comes to an end eventually. So in verse 7, the dust will return to the, to the earth as it was. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. So if you simply concern yourself about the life in this world, then it is vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Our life on earth is vanity without God. So remember your creator. He says that again and again. Now let's look at verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. And what was written and was, was upright. Words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, like sticks, spear. And the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books, there is no end. So if you simply pursue studying in this world without searching for the truth in the Bible, there is no end. And also it says much, it says, um, uh, much study is wearisome to the flesh. Because people search for the truth and people search for the answers to all these questions that they have in philosophy, maybe in science, and yet they do not find the answer. The answer is in the truth, the Bible, the Word of God. And the conclusion is in verse 13 this, fear God and keep his commandments, which simply says keep his word. For this is man's all, this is man's destiny. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So eventually, as we saw before, we will all stand before God. We will receive a summon from God to stand before him and give an account of our life. Whether it was good or evil, the perfect, just God and judge will bring to judgment every work, whether that was a secret or not, whether it was hidden from others or not. All the things that we have done and thought in our life will be brought to the judgment of God. So when you talk about personal eschatology, we are not concerned about um, just the fact that the death is the end of our life. Yes, death is not just the end. Yes, it is an end, but it is beginning for another. It is death of our physical life, and it is a transition into eternity. And in a sense, everybody lives eternally. Everybody. 
The question is whether you live in eternity in heaven or in eternal hell. Before that time comes, you are to remember your creator and go back to him. And of course, remembering God and also knowing the truth um, to go to heaven or not knowing the truth and ignoring the truth and therefore going to hell is what we're going to talk about next week. But today, simply um, just, to just to, to concern ourselves with eschatology, um, there are also some other verses that talk about things like this. Um, let me show you this. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. It says God appointed men to die once. Now we saw yes, um, not yesterday, last week, that God determined pre-appointed time for this world. And just in the same way, God appointed for every man to stand before him. It is appointed for men to die once. And after this comes the judgment. And that's why we need to ask a question like this. What is life, James asks. And he says, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Now look at this verse. It says, what is life? Now you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It might be that your life might come to an end tonight and stand before him just like that rich man in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Your soul is required of you tonight. So what is life? It's like a vapor. But look into this question. What is buried underneath this question is yet another question. What is life? It's like asking, then what is death? If you ask what is life, you have to also ask what is death. Because life comes to an end like a vapor. It is like a fog. It is like a grass. Maybe even a flower, but that withers and falls away so quickly. So what is death that comes after life? That's our follow-up question. And we saw what death was, or that what death is. There are three kinds of deaths that we, we talked about. There are also um, the reasons for death. And death is like a summon to appear before God. But of course, for believers, that's not the end. There's the resurrection to life. For unbelievers, there's the resurrection to eternal condemnation. We read from Romans 5.12, but um, this picture would be um, helpful to you. It says, just as one man, sin entered the world. And that one man is Adam. So through this one man, all these people who are born in this world, whether you live in America or Oceania, Australia or Asia or Africa, you are born with sin. And because of one man and all the people who have ever lived from the beginning of this world since Adam, to the end of this world in the future, they are all born with sin. They are born with a determined end if they continue to live without Christ. And that is the reason why we have death, because of sin. And hence in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. The price, the cost for sin is death. It's like you go into a shop, you pay a price, and you buy that product. That's the price, the cost. The fact that you have sinned means that you have already paid the price to buy your death. So you have already purchased death. You already have death in you. We are born into this world, physically speaking, to die, in a sense. As some people say, as soon as we are born, we begin to die. That's another way of looking at it, isn't it? Maybe there are more days to live if you're young. But as you get older, we realize that we have lived more days than the days that we have before us. In a sense, the statement that we're dying becomes even more real as we get older. And you ponder about this death, you know, why and what is death? The Bible says it is because of sin. The wages of sin is death. 
So when you look at personal eschatology, what is the message that this, um, the writer of Ecclesiastes gives us? This is going to happen. Look at this in chapter 12. All these things will happen to you. Eventually, there will be mourners who will mourn about your death. But remember before this happens. Remember your creator before your difficult days come. Before the day when you stand before the Lord God. In that court of God comes. Remember God, your creator. When you look around this world and see a lot of young people, Nowadays, uh, it's, I suppose it's been always the same. You know, whenever you lived, it's just more pronounced in our world, in our time, I suppose. But when you look at these young people who go on their lives, living their lives, without having any regard to, to things like this, simply wasting their life and wasting their, their precious time, and to think that they have really slim opportunity to hear messages like this and come to the knowledge of eternal heaven or going to eternal heaven, it is really depressing in a sense. The Bible also predicted, the Bible says that when the last days come, the more people will be ungodly and more people will be more um, hating instead of loving. Um, they will be more selfish. They will be lovers of money. They will be lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. They will love evil and immoral things. And they'll say what is bad, good, and what is good, bad, reversing the definition of good and evil. And these things are happening in more escalated ways in our time. So it is really, in a sense, very sad to see these people, young people, living their lives as it is predicted in the Bible, only to see themselves in this judgment before God, when that day comes suddenly, sometimes even young people end their lives tragically, and when they stand before the Lord God, what will they do? And what will they say? It's like that man in one of the parables that Jesus said, the man who came into the wedding feast without wearing that wedding garment that everybody was given freely to wear, he was found speechless. He was found speechless. In that parable, the master of the feast said to the servants, bind his feet and hands and throw him out into the outer darkness. Now, you, you don't do that to wedding guests. So this is clearly not about the parable. The story moves from the parable to the eternal truth because the parable only served the purpose of telling us the truth about eternal hell. And Jesus was simply saying, look, the people who are given that free, well, opportunity to receive the free gift of salvation, like that, the wedding garment, if you reject and refuse to wear that wedding garment, reject the grace of salvation, the gift of salvation, then you will be found speechless. You have no excuse. And you'll be bound and cast into outer darkness. That refers to eternal hell. So that's what the Bible teaches us. In the end, essentially we can summarize it in this way. Our life begins with birth. When we are born, we are born to live our life. But because of sin, death comes. We are born, but yet we die. And after death comes the judgment. And of course, there are two ways, two paths before us. One to eternal heaven and one to eternal hell. So it is either through Christ and through the truth you can be accepted to eternal heaven or to face the fate of eternal hell. And that goes on to eternity. So in a sense that is not really eschatology. It's not the end things. You can say that that is the eternal state. Endless state. Eternity also is not just some elongated long, long time. If it is long time, at least it will come to an end after some millions of years perhaps. But that's not the case. Eternity is ongoing and without any reference with time. You can say that the time stops in eternity. 
the clock stops. You can say that there's no sense of time as we know it in eternity. And to think that some people might spend their eternity in eternal hell with torment and pain is, to say the least, sad and heartbreaking. And just as we are, God is also very sorrowful. And he's also very brokenhearted because the people whom he has created reject his love and free offer of salvation and rather they choose to go to eternal hell with the devil under the devil's deception. Now we have the story of that in Genesis. Thankfully, Adam and Eve were given the grace of salvation, but we saw how they fell because they were tempted by the devil and we have the very same temptation right before us. We can listen to that and fall into eternal hell or we can turn around and repent as the Bible says and listen to the voice of God and find ourselves in the comfort of eternal heaven and the promise of coming into eternal heaven. Now that is next week. So um, I ask you to come again next week. Um, there'll be more people who will come. Uh, there are some, of us, some of us who are away, but um, they'll be here next week. And next, next Lord's Day, our third and final session of our Bible seminar, we will now have a look at um, that very thing. That how then can we be right with God and go to eternal heaven and avoid eternal hell? So that's a very important message, obviously. And that is the conclusion. As the, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is man's or man's duty and responsibility. Let's pray.